legged's, the four legged's, the creepy crawlies, the standing people, the trees, the, the up above, the down below, the weather beings. Everything is the people. Everything is in relationship to everything else. We live in a very mediumistic world. You know, we go out in nature and we're observing. But what we don't realize many times is that we're being observed. Um, and I don't know, I'm, I'm sure that there are some of you in this room who've had the experience of having, you know, like a bird show up in front of you in nature or an animal show up in front of you or something unexpected happening. And you're like, oh, that's so unusual. But really what has happened is that a member of your family has observed you and come to be in relationship with you. Um, so there's a lot of reciprocity in this practice. Uh, I've done some weather working with um, Nan Moss and David Corbin. They, they specialize in shamanic work. And they will actually sit outside. And because they've befriended the cloud people, they are, the cloud people respect them and talk to them. So if there's a small cloud out there, they'll say, would you please dissolve? And, you know, the cloud within about three minutes is gone. Just vaporized, gone. It's, it's truly amazing. But there is a tremendous amount of reciprocity uh, in this practice so that we, we realize we're in connection with everything and we live in such a way that we respect and are in reverence with everything that we're connected with, all of the members of our family. So we have a lot of spiders in my house that don't get sucked up in the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Every once in a while we have to move them because the webs get out of control. Um, okay. Um, we're all energy and vibration. That, that's one of the key takeaways tonight. We're all energy and vibration. Everything is energy and vibration. Just the packets that the energy shows up in looks different for a rock. The frequency of vibration is different for a rock than it is for a crow, than it is for a snake, than it is for a lion, than it is for you and me. But everything vibrates. Everything is tayena. Everything. So, um, some differences between traditional shamanic culture and modern culture is that, you know, in a more traditional culture, um, the young people were initiated into the community much more formally than they are in our society. You know, we have religious rites like communion and bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs where the youth are initiated, but not into the community at large, just into a religious community. And so, you know, what becomes initiation for most of our, our kids is like, you know, that night when you're 21 that you don't remember anymore. Um, you know, your friends take you out and, you know, you get drunk and, and that's it. There's no real initiation into manhood or womanhood. You know, and the best I could think of today when I was trying to think of an example is the military. That happens, um, you know, in a pretty terrifying way, but um, we don't initiate our youth into a common cultural belief anymore. Uh, one of the other things about our culture is that we're not what my teacher Joseph calls planted where we live. We don't understand the places where we live very well. You know, in, in old cultures, people didn't have electricity, they didn't have, uh, you know, heat, cooling, water, running water, and believe me, I am not advocating that we get rid of those things. I like turning on the tap and having hot water and getting in the shower. But people understood more and were more in sync with the cycles that happened. They understood when certain animals showed up in their land, when migrations happened, when you could plant certain things, when certain things were ripe to be harvested, and when you went inside for the winter and told the winter tales, that's in, you know, in my teacher's culture, in the Pueblo cultures, you told the winter tales in the winter time after the solstice so that the children understood the metaphors that were common to your culture. Uh, so we don't live so much in connection with cycles anymore unless we really, really make a practice of observing the moon or, you know, celebrating the seasons, um, watching migrations, watching plant life change and come and go. Uh, one other thing that is more common in our culture than in, in older times is that older people are not valued. The elder people are not valued for their wisdom. 
and we are focused very much on being young and beautiful and you know preserving our bodies and not you know not even thinking about the d word death so old people are not so much valued for their wisdom as kind of um, value devalued as not being you know, youthful and not and not knowing what young people know what not having the get up and go that they know and then death you know let's just put the word right out there it's not a process that we deal with through all of our lives we don't initiate ourselves we don't practice for death so you know it, it's going to happen but we don't we we avoid it to the extent that we can and we stay young and beautiful and you know preserve our bodies at all costs so that when it comes time to make that transition more and more i think in our society um, people aren't prepared for it and if you know anybody who has a haunted house or anybody who's had anything like that what my friends who do a lot of psychopomp work which is the, the transitioning of spirits that are stuck here is that more and more they're finding more and more spirits here they're finding more um, spirit possession happening with people uh, in places and because our society doesn't practice for this moment of transition that is it as inevitable as you know birth when you're pregnant so um, those are some differences and I think one of the real big ones is that we have no common cosmology as as cultures anymore you know you, you need a way to explain how the world works so that when you kind of go off the rails a little bit you come up against a boundary and you say oh I understand what's happening and you can bounce back to the center um, you know, Christians use the metaphor of heaven and hell as a cosmology. Uh, you know, I myself work with the medicine wheel, the directions and the metaphors of that. You can work with um, other cosmologies like um, the up in other shamanic cosmologies, upper world, middle world, lower world. But basically you're looking for something that explains how the world works and sets out metaphors for how to behave, principal ideas. And we don't have um, things that are so common to us anymore. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, we look at uh, always wanting to go to spirit. We want to be spiritual. We want to be um, out of our bodies. We want to um, be, you know, go to the light. Uh, and that is where I want to go eventually, but right now I'm here in a body. <laughs> and I want to go to the light just yet, and I want to enjoy the body I have while I'm in it. So, it, you know, a, a lot of religious practice teaches us that the body is bad, the body is sinful, but really the body, as I think it was Aldous Huxley said, is the gateway to perception. How do we understand this beautiful world that we're in if we don't do it with our senses? You know, it's wonderful to go to the light and to meditate and to lose all of this, but it's also really important to come back and be in the body. So I thank you for grounding us tonight and connecting us and bringing us into the body. Um, another important aspect in our in our cultural context is that we've lost connection to our soul and I don't mean soul in the religious sense uh, I mean soul the way has anybody here read Bill Plotkin's book Soulcraft? I highly recommend it um, he describes the soul part of us as that part of us that wants to be in the body the part that longs for wildness for mystery for meaningful engagement in the world how do we find that true self part of us that tells us really why we're here in the body that makes us want to be passionate about getting up every day? You know, what is it that pulls us? To, what's our destiny? What, that's our soul is connected to our destiny. Um, and we have lost a lot of that longing for that wildness because I think at some point in connecting with our souls, it leads us into dangerous territory. It leads us away from the corporate job. It leads us away from the, you know, the wife and kids. It leaves us away from, you know, the station wagon and the family dog. It leads us out into that wild place where we can find what, what's there beneath all of the, the trappings. Um, so, you know, we need to look more for our true selves, what makes us 
who we are. What is the blueprint for what brought us here to this incarnation? Why are we here? Um, and one of the things I have found about doing soul work with my clients is that when you connect with these principal ideas, bring them into form. This is a painting of my true self. Okay, she is connected to totems, she's rooted down into her heart, and she's connected with the cycles of nature. She blooms, she's got life going through her. It was important to me to bring this into form so it wasn't just an abstract concept, the true self. When we bring it into form, when we make shamanic art, we're not just making a representation of power, we make power. This is power. When you make a drum, you make power, and power speaks to the spirit. When you make rattles, you make power, and power speaks to the spirits. When I know you've seen movies uh, where people wear, uh, you know, Native Americans wear symbols or totems or, you know, specific animals represented on them. They're inviting power to connect with them. They make a representation of power. Um, so it's not just a picture. It's a connection to your own power, to your own deep inner soul. And when you make rattles, you're speaking power to spirit. You're inviting connection. So it's important in our culture where we're told when we're kids that we can color, but don't go outside the lines. And then, you know, when you're 13, you're told, put your crayons away and now learn math. You know, we all have that creative part of us that's kind of been turned off because it's not particularly valued in our society. You know, if you grow up, you'll be a starving artist or you'll have to get a waitress job if you want to be on Broadway. Creative self-expression um, is not valued so much in our society. Uh, but I have found, again, that working with intentional creativity connects us to who we truly are and what our power is. Um, one other thing I think we're not aware of, okay, we're doing pretty well here. Um, is living in this mediumistic world where everything has consciousness and is interacting with us, that we are open because we're not taught that this is a mediumistic world. We may discover it on our own, you know, because things show up in the bedroom at midnight uh, and talk to us. But what we don't realize is that we pick up on everything, every single thing. So what's in the media, what's on the television, what we, you know, if you ever walk down the street in Philadelphia, you can feel like you've been assaulted even if nobody ever touches you or crosses your path just because of uh, the anger that people might be carrying or the frustration after a long day of work or someone speaking harshly to someone that they're, you know, they're talking to. You're picking up that energy. You're picking it up. Uh, when we talk about illness in shamanic worldview, we're talking about spiritual illness that manifests as physical illness. And the way that happens is by losing uh, your medicine, your power. You either don't foster it or you don't protect it. And it, this other outside energy comes in and takes up residence and can displace your own medicine. So you develop uh, an energetic disturbance that can turn into emotional disturbance that ultimately will turn into physical dis-ease. So one of the ways in the modern world where we don't necessarily know our roles, we don't necessarily know our places in our communities, we don't take care of our energy body and our, our inner medicine is to learn what is the difference between me, my energy, myself, what I know, and what comes in from outside of me. So one of, we begin to learn the practice of discernment. What's mine? What is my vibration? I vibrate very differently than anybody else in this room than a road rage driver, than uh, you know, somebody angry on the streets of Philadelphia. I, vi I vibrate very differently. So if I get to learn my own vibration and how my body talks to me about my vibration, I can learn to listen to how my body talks to me about 
someone else's vibration being where it shouldn't be. Um, is this making any sense? Okay. Uh, so I thought uh, before we took our break that we would do a little exercise for um, working on the feeling in the body of our own energy. Does that sound okay? Um, and this is an exercise that comes from my teacher, Sandy Ingerman. It's in her book, How to Heal Toxic Thoughts, which is really a manual for life in the modern world, <laughs> if anybody's interested in reading that. Um, and, you know, Sandy teaches that all of us have five physical senses. Many of us have, well, all of us have additional senses beyond that. Some of us have cultivated them. Some of us have shut them off because they're very scary because of those people showing up in the bedroom at midnight. We don't want to know that. We don't want to know about that. Um, and we have not learned to dial it up or dial it down uh, unless we've gotten really good instruction from our helping spirits or from a good teacher who's had the experience of doing that. Uh, and so Sandy talks about paying attention to your body. Some of us have, have stronger physical senses. You know, we might be stronger visually. We tend to be a very visual culture. We want everything to be like TV or a movie. And if it doesn't happen that way, we don't think anything's happened to us. Uh, but actually, if we close the eyes, our other, our other senses become stronger. So you may find that as you work with this practice, you get a kinesthetic sense. You have a feeling in your body. It tightens, it loosens, it m moves. You may hear things. You may just know things. Um, you may just know. You may hear. I know when I'm working for a client and I know I've got the right answer, I hear a click. And it's almost like a puzzle piece going into place. I feel that piece go into place and I hear a click. So that's how I know I'm on the right track. So you may experience something like that, but don't necessarily expect that this is going to be visual. Be open to how it happens. Listen. If you know something, if a picture shows up in your mind, if you, know, you hear something, taste something, be aware of how you know what you know. Okay, so what we're going to do is just close eyes for a moment. Just like Amy did with us, take some deep breaths and allow your body to relax and allow yourself to feel the weight of your body in the chair. Our body can be our best friend. It can tell us about the uncanny. It can tell us about danger before we're aware it's going to happen. So our body is not just baggage that we drag around with us. So feeling the weight of your body in the chair, your feet on the floor, your hands, your arms on your thighs or wherever they may be resting, your shoulders, let them drop down, shoulder blades down the back. Just allowing the breath to be slow and easy. So now I want you to think about something that you love, something that you love without question. It could be a kind of flower, a color, a food, your cat or your dog, a place in nature, but think about something that you love without question. And I want you to say to yourself, in your head, I love whatever it is. And notice what happens in the body. And so let's do that again. I love Do you see a color? Do you feel a feeling? Just notice how your body reacts when you talk about what you know you love. One more time. I love. OK, now you can open your eyes. Did everybody get a reaction somehow? 
If not, then work with this at home. I promise you when there's not, you know, 40 people in the room and traffic noise, you will begin to tune into this. But what I'd like you to do now is just stand up. We're going to break the energy meme of this. Just stand up for a minute and take a step to the right and then a step to the left and sit on back down. <laughs> we just, we break up the energy template of that exercise, okay? Um, so we're not stuck in it. And now I want you to close your eyes again. And again, relax down into the breath, into the feeling of the body in the chair. Feeling your hands, your arms, your shoulders, heavy and relaxing down, your feet on the floor. And I want you to remember that thing you just told yourself about loving. And I want you now to say with that same object, person, animal, thing, I hate whatever it is. Again, I hate. And notice the reaction that you feel, see, smell, sense, know. What is your body doing in reaction? OK, you can open your eyes now. That is a way of discerning your truth, or what is true versus what is not true, without engaging the mind. The mind has an agenda. The mind will try to persuade you of what you know is not true as being true. It will also help you discern what's yours and what's not yours. Go into the body. You know, I've, I've worked with clients who will come to me and say, you know, last week I went into this deep depression. I don't know where it came from. I've never been depressed. I'm a happy person. I function well. I go about my life without any troubles like this. And, you know, I, I just, it came on me out of the blue. And I'll say, well, what's been going on in your life? And she'll say, well, you know, my sister this or my husband that. And really what she has done is tapped in to what is happening around her. Some, I, when, what was it? When Congress wasn't funding the budget last summer, my blood pressure went through the roof. It was, I, I had trouble separating my own energy. And I, you know, I practice it from what was happening in the collective around me, from what was all over the media, the panic, the hysteria, the, the, uh, you know, the news reports. And I just stopped watching. And I was fine. Because and I'm not suggesting we tune out from involvement in our community. But understand, I understood what was happening to me. Every time you know, I would put on the news and there would be something else about the budget. I just, I had to turn it off because I could feel the reaction coming up. So I was able to separate in my body what was mine and what was from outside. So work with the practice. And I highly recommend it for the upcoming election. <laughs> um, OK, time for a break. Does that work? OK, good. Then we will move on. Um, I want to teach you a practice. Um, that I learned from my Native American teacher, Joseph Royale, beautiful painted arrow. He's a Tiwa Indian uh, from uh, New Mexico, Picaris Pueblo, in, outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he teaches about healing with vibration. And I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about tonight, but when I was sleeping last night, I had a dream, and they said, teach them this for healing. So. Um, he t talks about the principal qualities of vowels. Loretta knows all about this. Um, each vowel, A-E-I-O-U, lives in a place in the medicine wheel. And each vowel is associated with the principal qualities of the place that it lives. So the, the letter A lives in the east of the medicine wheel. It's pronounced ah in his language, ah which is also the sound for the self. 
and because his culture doesn't separate the earth and the people's, the people's place in the earth from the self, the word for the earth is nah, N-A-H. So the self is contained in the word for the earth. So the principal um, vibration in the east is that of you know, the rising sun, dawn, inspiration where things come into form, things come into form. What has been planted elsewhere begins to flourish, to sprout. It begins to come into form. Uh, and it also has to do, Eagle lives in the east, and Eagle has the broad view. Eagle can see for miles, yet Eagle can see the tiniest mouse on the ground. So what Eagle represents is seeing unity and duality, the big picture and the little picture. So that's the principle of the east. So ah is the sound of the east. The sound in the south, e, is uh, pronounced eh, eh. And the, the south is the place of the summer, the, the hot place, the place of passion, the place where, the place of adolescence, which kind of makes sense, that hot place, that place of passion, right? Um, the place where we learn relationship to ourselves, our placeness, our plantedness. How do we relate to ourselves and what's around us? And our relationship, you know, relationships among communities, people, you know, in the traditional sense. Um, so Coyote lives in the South and he's the trickster, you know, the passionate trickster that's always throwing you upside down so you don't know what your placement is. And you have to come back and find your placement again. So that's eh. Uh, anyway, in the, the other metaphor for the, the South is where you cultivate what you've planted. The Tiwa people are farmers and also shepherds, but they farm corn, beans, and squash. And uh, so you cultivate the seeds that you've planted. And if you don't like the seeds, you pull out what you don't want to cultivate and you plant what you do want to cultivate because what you cultivate is going to show up in the harvest, which happens in the place of the West, mm -hmm. right? And the I is pronounced E, E. It's the word for uh, the, the principal vibration of awareness. So if you want to experience awareness in Joseph's tradition, go home, take the last of the summer corn, boil it and make some tea, and drink some corn tea. Close your eyes and drink some corn tea and open your eyes and experience awareness. Corn brings you to a place of awareness. It's a sacred plant in their culture. Uh, but anyway, uh, E is about awareness. The sound E is about awareness. It's also about reconciliation. Uh, because when we come into the place of the West, we're mature adults, we begin to reconcile ourselves to what we're going to harvest, to what we've planted and cultivated, what we're going to harvest. And we realize that, you know, day is growing shorter. Our time here is getting less and we become interested in what we're really going to focus on, who we're really going to become in our final service. The North is um, O, O, like it sounds, uh, and it's the place of ancient wisdom, the elders. The elders live there. It's the place of chaos, but not chaos in a bad way, chaos from which all potential possibilities can come. It's the void. It's the place from which creation comes. It's the winter time. It's the dream time. It's the place when everything seems frozen. There's really a lot happening under the soil, like the plants, the, the seeds are getting themselves ready. Everything is just in a state of rest, but everything is ready to come forth as soon as we get back to the east. Um, so that place from the north to the east on the wheel is where things come into manifestation, where we pull them down from the dream time into physical form here in our world. Um, the center place is the you, ooh, the place where God hides, the place where you always are. You and God are in the center. God hides in you, in their, in their belief. Um, so there, the word for God in the Tiwa culture is who. So when they speak English and they say who knows, 
it's a play on words. You know, how, what am I going to do next week? Who knows? <laughs> so it's, a, it's kind of a funny thing. Um, and then they, the Y is also pronounced E like the sound in the West. And Y is the bridge between the earth and the sky. It's the bridging sound. It's the road that people travel when they make their transition. Uh, it's the carrying principle, how we're carried and what we carry. So that's the cosmology that I work with, that you know, when I come up against a boundary or I go off the rails, I look at the medicine wheel and it brings me back. Where am I on the wheel? What's happening for me right now? What principle ideology or, or idea am I working with? And I can kind of figure out you know, what's operating and bring myself back there. But the chanting is um, the vibration of these vowels carries these principal ideas with them. So when you chant them, you are inviting, for instance, if you chant the eh sound for the south, placeness, you know, placement, relationship, you are inviting the being of relationship to walk with you. You're inviting it into whatever the situation is that you're chanting for. You're inviting in the principle of awareness or reconciliation or harvest when you chant the E sound. And just to take it one step further, Joseph says that when we chant the vowels in a person's name, we're praying for them. Because when you chant, th their names represent the principal ideas that their souls are carrying in this incarnation. So that when you chant those sounds, you're praying for their principal ideas and their souls. So, um, what I would suggest that we do in our remaining time before the break is chant the sound ah, the A, the sound for the self, the sound for seeing unity and duality, the sound for inspiration, the sound for new beginnings represents the spring, the sound for sprouting what it is that we would like to grow and then cultivate and harvest at some point. So if there's a project that you want to start with or someone that needs a new beginning, you can think about them while you're doing this. Or you can just think about yourself and the earth because that ah sound also represents the earth. So um, be open to ideas popping into your head, to pictures. Uh, sometimes we hear voices that aren't here chanting with us. Um, anything can happen. You're not making it up. It's really happening. So it goes like this. Uh, just chant. Uh, he typically does it in a monotone, but people, as we get deeper into the chant, will break off into harmonies or change tones or change rhythms. So let this be as it comes up and happens for you. And it'll end when it's ready to end. It has a way of doing that. Okay? So here we go. Uh...
the silence. Take questions or should I do that in the afternoon? Okay.